Welcome back, lovers and haters of Earth Science. In our last episode, we started to venture into our relative aging experience. You're old. Well then. And we used some key principles to determine whether rocks or geologic events were older, or rocks or geologic events were younger. And in today's episode, we're going to be correlating till the cows come home. Correlating straight from my iPhone. Correlating all day and all night. Correlating based on my own side. So, let's get into this video. So, in today's episode, we're talking all things correlation. And I'm sure there are some of us out there wondering, what is this correlation you made sick beats about? Yikes. And correlation, folks, simply means to match. So a couple of images are going to pop up on screen. And I want you to tell me, do they correlate or not? Round one, fight. So these two images, they don't really correlate because they're different shapes and they're different colors. All right, let's try again. Round two, fight. Well, these correlate a little bit better because they are the same shape, but they're not the same color. All right, one more round. Ready, go. Final round, fight. So these two, they correlate because they're the same shape and they're also the same color. And guess what, folks? We actually use this correlation when we study Earth's past. So let's take a closer look at what it actually means to correlate in regards to geologic history. So as we know now, correlation means to match. And when we're speaking in geologic terms, we're matching rocks and geologic events in one location with rocks and geologic events in another location. So take this diagram at the bottom, for example. Section A on the right side is the same rock as section A on the left side, even though they aren't connected. And the way that we actually correlate rock layers is by using four different methods. The first being walking the outcrop, which is matching nearby rock layers that appear to be the same type and thickness. And an outcrop is simply a surface of exposed bedrock. Now, a great place to visualize this first method of correlating rock layers is at the Grand Canyon. And this is because it provides excellent visuals to show how layers of rock can be correlated by walking the outcrop. Because you can see that the layers match up across the canyon. And here's a more detailed diagram of the Grand Canyon to show you how rock layers on one side of the Grand Canyon match up to rock layers on the other side of the Grand Canyon as we walk the outcrop. Nice! So now we've got a better idea of what correlation means in regards to earth science. And we have our first method that scientists actually use to correlate rocks. But before we continue, I want to make sure that we all know what a rock outcrop is. So I'm sure that most of us have driven down Interstate 87. Or any major highway for that matter. Now, I'm also sure that we've seen these as we drive down any of those major roads. And guess what, folks? That exposed rock, that be a road outcrop. And that's what us scientists folk like to correlate. So now that we have a better idea of what we're actually trying to correlate, let's go ahead and take a look at the second method we use to correlate different rock layers. So the second method we use is comparing properties of rocks. So what we do when we compare the properties of rocks is we're matching the color, texture, and composition of rock strata, which is simply a layer of rock. So take a look at the image on screen, and you tell me, 
How many different rock layers can you correlate just based on color? Okay, so I'm sure we all got different answers here. But for the sake of our sanity, folks, we're going to focus on three distinct rock layers I know we can all see. So, as you can clearly see here, folks, these three rock layers are not the same. And we can tell that solely based on their color. But the real question here is, how the heck does this help us correlate them? Well, I want you to imagine that you're here. And you can only see this section of area. So to you, it's just going to look like a giant horizontal layer of pale tan rock. And not what we're actually seeing on screen. Now I want you to imagine that you're here. And your sight of view is this area. And let's just say from the point you were at, to the point you are now, is 25 miles away. Well, it might be easy to visualize here because we can see the big picture. But if you were actually there, how would you be sure that this rock layer was the exact same rock layer you saw 25 miles away? And the answer is simple but effective. Because if this rock layer you are currently at has the same color, texture, and composition, as the rock you saw over here, there's a really good chance you're actually looking at the same rock layer. So folks, just remember, if you find rock layers that are the same color, thickness, and made of the same stuff, even if they're 10, 20, or 100 miles apart, there's a real good chance that they're the same rock layer. <laughs> And now it's time we look at our third feature that helps us to correlate rock layers, which happens to be volcanic ash markers. So, volcanic eruptions leave a layer of ash that's hundreds to even thousands of miles away from the actual volcano itself. Say what? And we can use these volcanic ash markers as a super helpful tool to help us correlate rock layers for two specific reasons. The first reason is because it represents an event that took place very rapidly. And the second reason, as I mentioned before, is because it's very widespread. Which allows us to pinpoint the age of the ash layer itself and all the surrounding rock layers next to that ash layer. So take a look at this map right here. This map represents the path that the ash cloud traveled after the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helen, stretching all the way across the entire United States. Our travel agent, Miss Wind, she did some serious work here, folks. And the idea is this. As that ash layer settles down and more rock is deposited on top of it, it leaves a sort of bookmark in time for that specific eruption that looks like this and allows us to determine a lot of important information about the surrounding rocks. And although we're not using the 1980 eruption to correlate any rock layers, because as we all know, it takes a lot longer than 40 years to make rocks. Oh, right. It's not the first time that a volcano has erupted. Duh. And it certainly won't be the last, because as we all know, volcanic eruptions are very unpredictable. Nope. Now the fourth and probably one of the most helpful of correlating methods are index fossils. And index fossils are a fossil of an organism that lived over a very wide geographic area for a relatively short period of time. And it's because of this widespread origin and short lifespan that they are so useful. Because if the organism lived for an extremely long period of time, let's say billions of years, it wouldn't do us much good in accurately dating anything. So take a look at each of these outcrops, which represent rocks in vastly different areas. 
and the fossils within them. And you tell me, which would be the best index fossil? And before we get started, keep in mind, a good index fossil is widespread and only lives for a very short period of time. So I'm going to give you 10 seconds on the clock, and I want you to try and figure out which of the fossils is the best index fossil. Ready? Go. So, if you said the shell on the second layer from the top, you got it. This shell right here, because it's found in all four outcrops, which means that it's widespread, but it's only found in one rock layer, which means it lived for a short time. And that, folks, is why it's a good index fossil. So, let's look at a second example. Knowing what we know now, which letter would represent a good index fossil? 10 seconds, Jeopardy music cue, and go. Okay, so if you said C, you got this down. Because remember, a good index fossil is widespread and short-lived. Now, there's something I need to know before we continue any further, folks. So, when you run into correlation problems, the rock layers aren't always going to line up. And that's because, as we all know, there are plenty of disturbances ah! that change the position of specific rocks in different locations. So here's the idea. You should always work off of a key feature like a volcanic ash marker or an index fossil first. And once you've lined those up, you can then correlate the rest of the rock layers. And it's as easy as that, folks. Yeah, says you. And now it's time we look at the beautiful life that our home has already lived, long before us humans came around. So we actually use scientific evidence and data to date the Earth at about 4.6 billion years old. And we use what's called the geologic time scale to look at all the amazing experiences that our Earth has already had. Now, this time scale was created by geologists and subdivides time into different units based on fossil evidence. And I'm sure we all know, but a fossil is any evidence of life. Duh. So let's go ahead and check this geologic time scale out. So this monster is our geologic time scale, which can be found on page 8 and 9 of your Earth Science Reference Table. The time scale here is in millions of years, which I've highlighted. Now, there is something to note here, ladies and gents. If you check out these numbers down here, like 4600, it means this section of the time scale is 4600 million years old which actually means 4.6 billion years old. Just something you need to be aware of. Now, the next thing we need to look at are these four boxes right here, which represent units of time. Eon being the largest time unit, then era, then period, and finally, epoch, which represents the smallest unit of time on our geologic time scale. Now, the two boxes that I've highlighted represent eons. And as you can see, all of Earth's history is represented by just two eons. Now, the next time scale used is era. And to give you an idea of how much smaller it is, our second eon, Phanerozoic, is broken down into three eras. Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. And that, folks, that makes up the four major time zones of Earth's history. So let's go ahead and look at the first major time zone, the Precambrian Eon, which actually makes up 88% of all of Earth's history. And believe it or not, there's actually no fossil evidence during this time period. And the thought process is that organisms were probably too small and too soft to become fossils. 
And on top of that, folks, most of the rock was not sedimentary rock. And as we all know, if it's not sedimentary rock, you ain't finding any fossils in it. And this, well, this is a depiction of what Earth might have looked like during the Precambrian eon. Next on our list of major time zones is the Paleozoic era, which makes up about 7% of Earth's history. Now, during this time zone, invertebrates, fish, amphibians, vertebrates, land plants, and land animals all made their first appearance. And this is what Earth most likely looked like during the Paleozoic era. After that is the Mesozoic era, which represents about 4% of all of Earth's history. And this is where we find evidence of dinosaurs, early birds, and early mammals. And here's a depiction of what Earth most likely looked like during the Mesozoic era. Now, the last of the major time zones is called the Cenozoic Era, and it represents only 1% of all of Earth's history. And this is where you find fossil evidence of modern mammals and modern plant life. And this is what the early Cenozoic Era most likely looked like. And that brings us to now, folks. And a summary based on what we just talked about is that for most of Earth's history, life did not exist. And the fossils that we do find give us great evidence into the evolution of life on our planet. Now, I'm sure there are some of us wondering out there, well, how the heck long have humans been around for? And the answer is that we're very new to our favorite mud rock. So I think a better question is how new? So in order to show just how new human beings are to our favorite mud rock, we're going to take all of Earth's history and turn it into one calendar year. So January 1st represents the formation of Earth, and December 31st is going to represent present day. Now if this were the case, human beings made their first appearance with about 24 minutes left in the year, which represents about 100,000 years. And what always amazes me is how much we've evolved in just a short period of time. It makes me wonder, what's the next 100,000 years gonna look like for the human race? Well, that's if we make it that far. And that's gonna do it for this episode, folks. So, as always, complete all your additional assignments, and I'll see you on the next episode of Earth Science 2020.